You might be curious about how teachers grade exams, right? Why sometimes exam scores don't turn out as expected. Even though you felt confident during preparation, you're surprised by the results. Today, in this video, I'm going to reveal the questions students want to know but teachers may not want to answer, or even dare to. Why do I dare to answer them? First, I don't name any schools or individuals. Second, I'm just a nobody. Most importantly, I want students to understand the mistakes in the eyes of teachers, so they know what to do. Without further ado, let's address one of the most concerning questions for students. Does the school intentionally fail students to increase revenue? This question is really overthinking things. If a university needs to rely on students retaking exams to sustain its expenses, it indicates poor management by the university's leadership. In fact, teachers are more concerned about seeing students fail than students might think. When dealing with students on the brink of passing, such as those who are just one or two points away from passing, lenient markers might turn a blind eye and let them pass. This is because many universities require teachers to analyze and evaluate grades. If the failure rate exceeds a certain percentage, such as 20%, teachers may be required to submit a targeted report analyzing why most students couldn't answer certain questions in their answering methods, and to propose suggestions and commitments for improving educational methods. However, when a test has hundreds or even thousands of examinees, if all students pass, the school may adjust the grades to ensure the quality and standards of the institution. For example, slightly raising the passing score from 60 to 65. Or regrade those papers of students on the pass-fail border, they may adjust or retract scores for answers that were close but not entirely correct. This also explains why teachers often say, we need to set higher goals. Question 2. Is the exam fair? To be honest, humans aren't machines, so achieving 100% fairness is unlikely, don't you think? I can only say that teachers will try their best to ensure the fairness of the exam. In cases where more than one examiner is grading the same subject, teachers typically hold meetings before grading to carefully plan the marking scheme, avoiding each teacher grading according to their own standards to ensure fairness. Just like math students know, some math problems require specific formulas to solve, such as binomial expansion. Here's a real-life example. A student used a formula that the principal examiner deemed incorrect when answering a question. Even if the calculation was entirely correct and the answer was right, some strict examiners believed that apart from the final answer, the other calculations deserved no points. Their rationale was that the student was simply lucky, especially since it had been emphasized in class. Therefore, a 10-point question only received one point, resulting in a lower final grade. Out of curiosity, what if we changed the numbers? I found that, keeping the square root, using the student's calculation method resulted in the correct answer regardless of other numbers. In other words, if I was the principal examiner, the student wouldn't be considered wrong because this wasn't an isolated case, nor was it luck. So, to that student, don't blame me for not defending you. If your own teacher won't speak up for you, what can I, a nobody, do? Therefore, even if the questions are similar, grading methods can vary depending on examiners. What examiners can do is ensure that exams adhere to basic fairness principles. As for fairness between different departments, it's difficult to guarantee, let alone comparing across schools. Question 3. Why do teachers always remind students not to leave blanks on the exam paper, even if they don't know the answer? Is it helpful? The answer is yes. As long as it's not made up nonsense, it can indeed be helpful, and may even be the key to lifting your final grade by a level. You see, it's not about what the student thinks is correct, but what the teacher deems is correct. Sometimes, even if the answer given by the student isn't entirely correct, if it's somewhat on point, many teachers will still consider giving marks. Many students may not know that many schools use the follow-through marking or own figure rule grading method. What are the benefits of this grading method? Often, exam papers will have consecutive questions where, for example, question B requires the answer from question A to be answered. Many students choose to skip question B if they can't answer question A, but this is a mistake. The correct approach is to write something, anything, even if you can't answer question A, because having an answer allows you to attempt question B. For instance, suppose the screen shows the questions from your paper. Clearly, question A involves addition and subtraction, while question B involves multiplication and division. Suppose we can't answer question A or make a careless mistake. Don't worry, if we bring the answer from question A to question B and the method is correct, even if the answer obtained doesn't match the marking scheme or answer sheet prepared by the principal examiner, according to the follow-through marking and own figure rule grading methods, we can still score even full marks. 
Of course, whether it's full marks or not also depends on the difficulty of the question. The purpose of this is to ensure that students aren't repeatedly penalized for the same mistake. I'm not afraid to tell you, some lenient teachers really use this grading method to the fullest. For example, for questions about matrices, one principal examiner's marking scheme is to deduct 0.5 points if a student copied 1 to 4 numbers incorrectly and deduct 1 point if it's 5 to 8 numbers, then instructs examiners to grade based on the numbers provided by the student. In other words, even if a student copied the question incorrectly, if the calculation is correct, they still have the possibility of getting close to full marks. What do you think of this principal examiner's way of grading? Feel free to comment in the comments section. As for why sometimes a first-class honor graduate from university A can't compare to a second-class honor graduate from university B, I believe you understand now, right? This is also why some companies require employees to obtain internationally recognized professional certificates with strong credibility, such as ACCA, SOA, P, CCNA, and so on. Question 4. Will schools raise the threshold for getting an A or reduce the number of a grades awarded? Yes, it's possible. Otherwise, why do you think exam papers aren't returned? Because too many students getting A would raise doubts about the quality of the exam papers. When the number of students getting A's is too high, many schools will choose to slightly raise the threshold for getting an A, such as increasing it from the original 80 points to 85 points to reduce the number of students getting an A. So, I strongly advise all candidates, when encountering questions that are not too sure about, not to give up or leave them blank. Because you may well gain some points thanks to the grading methods mentioned above. And these few points could affect your final grade. In addition, some schools, to ensure their standards, will enforce keeping the number of students getting an A within 20% of the overall number of candidates. In other words, from highest to lowest scores, only the top 20% of candidates have the chance to get an A. Of course, this practice of adjusting scores is not common, because teachers responsible for setting the questions basically know what types of questions most candidates can answer and what types only some candidates can answer. Barring any surprises, they can usually control the number of grades and failures well. As for why schools do this, one reason is to ensure the employment rate of students after graduation. Because if a grades are handed out casually, it will be criticized by the outside world as low standards, due to the disparity between the scores and actual abilities. Here's a true story to share with you. There was a student who graduated from University A, and he said that during his time at University A, even if he didn't attend classes much and didn't prepare for exams, he could easily pass. However, the price was that after graduation, even though he sent out many job applications and attended numerous interviews, no company hired him for nearly a year. In desperation, he had to enroll in a university with higher standards. After graduation, he was hired within three months. So, sometimes, don't criticize the difficulty of school exams too much. Question 5. Why do exam papers always include questions that require higher order thinking skills? The reason is like the previous question. Perhaps many students don't know that schools with standard often have so-called experts in the field, evaluate various aspects of the school, including the exam papers. I remember one time they criticized a subject in a department for having too few HOTS questions. To meet their requirements, many HOTS questions were added to the exam paper, significantly increasing its difficulty level. As a result, over 50% of the students failed. I won't comment on whether this is related to the teaching methods of the subject teacher. But purely in terms of the HOTS questions, especially those without specific answers, basically no candidates can give an answer that completely matches the one provided by the principal examiner, and it's even difficult to find similar answers. I'm not afraid to tell you, since nobody knows who's leaking the information. In those HOTS questions, most of the questions cannot even be perfectly answered by tutors and some lecturers, let alone the students. Imagine if the markers were not familiar with those questions, and then they were too embarrassed to continuously bother the principal examiner to confirm whether the student's answers were acceptable. How do you think the markers would grade when they find that the answers given by the students do not match the marking scheme? I can tell you that I have encountered markers like this before. So, why do some people say that exams are 70% effort and 30% luck? Because part of that 30% luck includes who your marker is. Something to tell, but I must emphasize, this is completely unrelated to the discussion. If students find that many of the exam questions far exceed the expected level or are not within the course structure or course plan, students have the right to collectively request a retest. However, the premise is that students can provide clear evidence and are brave enough to argue their case. Today's revelations end here. If you have any questions, feel free to leave a comment in the comments section. If it's within my knowledge scope, 
I'll do my best to answer. Additionally, if you have anything you want to confess or vent about, you can also send an email to the address displayed on the screen. Okay, that's all for this video. Thanks for watching and have a nice day.